and the Palestinian and the Palestinian uh, struggle. Uh, it was a long journey uh, that eventually brought me to a direct clash with the Israeli academia, forced me to leave uh, Israel to teach uh, in England. Uh, my work is mainly on the history of Palestine, but I also wrote books on the history of the Middle East, and I'm also more philosophically kind of interested in the relation between power uh, and knowledge. And uh, uh, in recent years, I'm very much focusing on Palestine studies at the University of Exeter, which is mainly a postgraduate program uh, that uh, also uh, has other extracurriculum activities all meant to expand the knowledge uh, on Palestine, its history, its present, and its future uh, prospects. Fantastic, thank you so much. And um, Gilbert, if we can hear from you next. Okay, uh, I'm from Lebanon, originally, and I've been in this country since uh, 2007, when I was uh, offered a chair at, uh, at SOAS in Development and uh, Studies on International Relations. Um, I'm the author of, of several books. Uh, the most related to our topic, uh, there are several related to our topic, but uh, is uh, the Arabs and the Holocaust, the uh, Arab Israeli War of Narratives. Uh, that's, uh, I would say, my most important uh, work on, on the topic or direct relation to the topic. Other than that, I've written books on the Arab uprising, one called The People Want, the Radical Exploration of the Arab Uprising, which is coming out next month for a second uh, edition in, in English, uh, augmented, I and mean, with a new preface. And, uh, and that's it. And I'm working now and filling the Haku on a book on the ongoing situation, uh, not in the Middle East this time, but the global one in continuation of a book I published that more than 20 years ago under the title, The New Cold War. So you can see that the title was uh, pre premonitory. Fantastic. And some Yeah, I guess uh, the best way to say is that my work has been uh, focused on the question of Jewish identity in Israel, but specifically recently I've been, uh, I guess, trying to come to an understanding to interpret Zionism's convoluted relations with its own Jewish identity, or in other words, uh, when it comes to Israeli politics, what does it mean? What, it, what does it mean for Israel to identify the Jewish state, and how this that lack of coherence about this question plays into the Israeli politics? Fantastic. So, um, thank you for those introductions. I think we will go ahead and get started. So. We're going to talk a little bit about Zionism's ideolog ideological history to start with. So in order for us to understand contemporary Zionism, we want to kind of explore its origins a little bit. So as an ideology, Zionism is kind of popularly understood to have arisen in the late 19th century in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, as both a movement of national revival and also as a reaction to anti-Semitism. Um, and many people consider Theodor Herzl to be the founder of modern political Zionism as he envisaged um, the founding of an independent Jewish state. So despite this, um, Yaakov, you emphasize a plethora of voices that are involved in constructing a Zionist ideology. So could you tell us briefly kind of what those voices are and, and what the core of its conception? Well, I think, uh, first of all, it might, uh, I think it's easy to identify that widely and uh, expensively, expensively and inclusively in a way that would include different streams as a reading of Jewish identity or a, re a reading of Jewish history itself in terms of the modern nation state, the European modern, modern nation state. So applying the concepts that developed in Europe, maybe in the 18th, 17th and 18th century to, to the Jewish nation or the Jews and actually to identify a Jewish nation as the subject of this uh, uh, interpretation. And then from this, I think it comes almost as a necessary conclusion that uh, the co this collective, the, the Jewish nation, um, has a right to self-determination, ultimately to be a nation state. But when the idea first emerges, it doesn't necessarily 
focus on a say. Um, and <laughs> any claim to territory, which is also not a necessary uh, a part of the Zionist ideology. Famously, when Herzl contemplates, when Theodor Herzl, who is considered to be at least a formulator of modern political Zionism or political Zionism, uh, per se, when he contemplates the notion of where uh, such a nation state or such a polity of Jews might uh, be established, he doesn't uh, rule out other alternatives to Palestine. But this is the, you know, it's, and, and under this, uh, I guess, larger uh, umbrella, uh, varying readings of the Zionist idea have existed. Um, political Zionism, as you correctly termed it, is only one string among them, but it is a triumphant one. And um, I guess it's political in the notion that it is it, that it ultimately aims for a nation state, regardless of the uh, minutia, I would say, of the history of when the different uh, factions of Zionist, uh, uh, of the Zionist movement actually claim uh, a right to say. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's important to know when people now consider Zionism and, um, and the way it has developed that there were readings of Zionism. I can give maybe the most famous name in this regard, Hannah Arendt. Mm -hmm. She was a member of the Zionist uh, organization. She was a self proclaimed Zionist, but she wasn't a state. She wasn't a political Zionist. So she didn't, she didn't think uh, the Jews uh, should ultimately coalesce around the nation state. Other readings, which were ultimately also statist, uh, focused on culture or on, uh, on other uh, important elements within this, uh, what they saw as a national revival. Uh, so I just, I think it's important to, to know that historically, this all coalesced around the nation state. And when we say Zionism today, we usually mean to this specific interpretation of, yeah, of the political Zionism rather than anything else. So we talked about how kind of, I mentioned how modern Zionism was um, kind of arose in part due to raging anti-Semitism in Europe in the 20th century and, and how that kind of gave rise to political Zionism um, and to people actually moving to uh, Israel-Palestine. Um, so, but what was more important in kind of shaping um, Zionist ideology, would you say it was kind of a contemporary development such as anti-Semitism or was it more Jewish religious belief? If, um, Gilbert, if you'd like to come in on those two. Would you like to me? Oh, <laughs> oh, to both of you. About religion, <laughs> <together. Yeah. laughs> okay, but uh, let, let me uh, add a different perspective. Mm. It's true that Zionism is a reaction to, to anti Semitism. You have had centuries of oppression of Jews in Europe, and then you had in Western Europe a uh, move towards uh, assimilation and uh, Let's say uh, a democratic solution of, of this problem. Uh, but this uh, uh, regressed by the end of the century. Why so? Because you had uh, an economic crisis. This is the first major crisis of global of yeah. capitalism, as a, as a global mode of production. And you had uh, at the same time migration of Jews from Eastern Europe, where you had, you still had pogroms, uh, you know, massacres of Jews, a lot of uh, anti-Jewish uh, uh, Jews, migration into Western Europe at the time of crisis in Western Europe. So you have the same ingredients that you have today with Muslims. At that time, that produced anti-Semitism. Today, that produces Islamophobia, right? And that's that's what you have now. There were several reactions to anti-Semitism. Statist Zionism, I would call it statist because political, who's not political? Nobody, the other currents are political too. It's like political Islam, doesn't make sense. For me, these are terms that don't make much sense. Statist Zionism hmm, uh, is but one reaction to this anti-Semitism. There were different, very, very uh, 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 different, I mean, uh, even contradictory with with, uh, with the, the Zionist perspective, which was one of uh, of uh, uh, solving the question by leaving, right? And I should say, if you read carefully, because people don't read carefully, if you read carefully 
the manifesto of state Zionism, which is called the state of the Jews, the right translation, in English translated the Jewish state. It's not the same thing, but no problem. Uh, uh, it is a clearly a book by an Austrian Jew in an area where you start, you had started having this assimilation and that had regressed, who is trying to find a way for these Eastern European Jews to go somewhere in order to diffuse the tension in Western Europe. He addresses uh, European Jews by telling them, look, it's in your interest to support this movement, to create a state you know, somewhere, to, 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 to send there these poor Eastern European Jews so that they don't create all this trouble for you uh, in, in where, where you are. That, that's the, the, the logic and we have to, to, to and that's why, how, how he thought he, he would accomplish that, that was by joining quite late actually, the colonialist movement. And so he, he speaks of a colony and we will, he says, we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, work in, in this direction. We will build uh, a, a, an island of civilization in the midst of barbarism somewhere. Barbarism be it in Africa, Middle East, wherever, you know, that's the view. Uh, and that, that's his perspective, which is very much part of the colonial spirit of that time. Uh, Hannah Arendt uh, actually underlined these, uh, these aspects. So that's the point. That's, I think, an important, very important dimension of what it is, because ultimately that's how you understand how it is basically a settler colonial movement, and that the last person who would have challenged this definition is Theodore Herzl, because he was, <laughs> for, for him, that was exactly what he wanted to do. Thank you so much. So um, now moving to Elan, you frequently argued that it's possible to be anti-Zionist without being anti-Semitic. Um, so could you run us through slightly through that kind of distinction um, and why it has sometimes been seen as a controversial position? Yes, definitely. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, I think there's always a difference between, first of all, ideology and faith, between ideology and religion. Judaism is a religion. Uh, and uh, Zionism is just one of many, many ways one can express that uh, religion. And opposing uh, uh, Zionism and looking at the history of those who oppose Zionism, which include quite a lot of Jews who oppose Zionism in the past and in the present, shows you that the major incentive in opposing Zionism is either uh, opposing the main precepts, the main uh, constitute elements of, of Zionism as an ideology, you don't accept the ideology, or, and I think this is far more true about anti-Zionism since the beginning of the colonization of Palestine, because of how this ideology is practiced on the ground and its impact on the indigenous native people of Palestine. So, so opposing an ideology which is framed rightly or wrongly, doesn't matter, by the way, as settler colonialism, which has a very strong racist uh, undertones, uh, which has caused the uh, ethnic cleansing of so many people and still uh, uh, is causing uh, misery and suffering for so many people who live there, uh, is basically an anti-racist and anti-colonialist move rather than a move, a, a position of hatred to someone because of someone's religion. Anti-Semitism, on the, uh, on the other hand, which should be called anti-Jewishness because there are Semites who are not Jews as well, but what we call anti-Semitism is a, a, a hatred of Jews because of their religion, regardless of how they behave or what they do to others, the, the very faith is at the center of the animosity. So uh, these are really two very different uh, human uh, position. Uh, one is a very inclusive one, a very uh, uh, progressive one in many ways, and uh, intersects very uh, easily, morally, ideologically, and politically with other anti-racist position human beings are taking today or in the past, whereas uh, anti-Semitism belongs to the group of uh, uh, ideologies that uh, wreaked uh, uh, racism, uh, uh, destruction, and were based on uh, defaming people just because of who they are 
uh, and uh, usually ended in, in uh, horrible uh, uh, policies uh, that were pursued uh, against these people because of their color, religion, or, or culture. So um, I, I, I find the equation very strange, uh, very shallow, very superficial, and uh, at least of the equation of that is now dominating, for example, the discussion in British academia and British politics, I'm even more, uh, I'm even less impressed by that because we have this discussion because Israel weaponized anti-Semitism in order to silence discussion on Palestine and in order to justify its unacceptable policies towards the Palestinians on the ground. Thank you so much for that. So, um, Yaakov, you discuss in your book uh, the idea of Israel, a history of power and knowledge, um, the relationship between the Zionism and Israel. Um, so, is it possible to support Zionism without supporting some of the ways that it's manifested in support Israel? Zionism, no. Without supporting the ways in which it's manifested in Israel? Or is that not a way? Uh -huh. That's a very interesting question. Can you be a Zionist and uh, still a, crit a critic of Israel? Mm. There obviously are people who identify as uh, specifically to say leftist uh, Zionists who are critical of Israel, but uh, I think it's a it's a precarious position. More and more so, we see liberal Zionism as a very uh, how would you say uh, it's a as a position that comes very uh, very fast to to a dead end in a sense, uh, struggling with its own understanding of um, of Jewish identity. I think a lot, of, a lot of this has to do with the fact that uh, what Zionism did, uh, Zionist ideology did, among many other things, maybe the most important thing, if it goes back to your question to uh, Gilbert, it, uh, it revolutionized, it rebelled against the tradition and the way it understood the meaning of a Jewishness being in the world or a Jewish being in the world. Uh, and it sought to reformulate the meaning of Jewishness, which would later be the supposed basis of a polity. But uh, other than a strong rebellious impetus against tradition, which at the same time appropriates parts of this relation to promote um, an ideological political agenda, Zionism um, never bothered if it could have actually uh, struggled with the question. It never bothered to answer the question of uh, what is the new modern political um, definition or understanding of Jewishness that you propose. And it ends up relying very flimsy on a certain understanding of Jewish tradition that leaves it in a very precarious position. Now, liberal Zionists do not question that point. They, they question specifically what happened after 1967. They, specific, they question specifically state politics um, in relation to the West Bank and Gaza, um, believing some, the, ba the basic premises of Zionism, the right of domination and the understanding of Jewishness on, as a nationality and so forth, um, to be almost self-evident. Um, and I think uh, while this is a viable position, if you judge what you know, the political map is, um, considered normatively, considered maybe philosophically, it, uh, it comes out as, as, as highly problematic. Thank you. Um, so we're actually we're going to move on. I've realized we are running a bit short on time. So we're going to move on to Zionism social history now. So kind of throughout the 20th century, um, there are obviously various different types of Zionism which have arisen, which you talk about, um, and they've been associated with different demographics and priorities as well. Um, and you know, people count as ten different types of Zionism, for example. And it's kind of difficult to, to market, like to demarcate them in a kind of a categorical perspective, mm -hmm. it's much more linear, but um, are there any different types of Zionism which are associated maybe with uh, different demographics or different geographical mm -hmm. areas, either in or outside of Israel? I would just raise it differently. I think there are different understandings of different readings mm -hmm. of what Zionism means nowadays, uh, specifically in Israel. And maybe what you were alluding to, I would uh, stress the point that uh, we already discussed the fact that Zionism uh, the ideology, the movement, the, the leadership, the understanding all emerging Europe, Central Europe, and then kind of uh, redefined or re, uh, reformulated by uh, mostly scholars, uh, sorry, mostly ideologues from uh, Eastern Europe, mostly from 
where the war is now raining. Um, and then having established a, a settlement project in Palestine and having uh, gained statehood, it absorbs, it invites and absorbs uh, a vast majority of uh, Jews from other places of the world, specifically the Middle East and North Africa, who share an understanding of, I would call it Jewish peoplehood, but with the meaning of this people uh, rather differently from what the official ideology, state ideology, state itself um, understands. And one way of understanding the, the tensions within Israeli society, uh, it is not just a matter of ethnicity, racial politics, class politics. It is also an issue of how the different parties read the relation between Jewish tradition and the political reality of the state of Israel, regardless of uh, the ideological justifications of it. So what does it mean for you to be today Jewish in Israel? And I think the, uh, the quarrels around the North return, uh, sorry, uh, the quarrels around the, uh, the basic nation, uh, sorry, the basic law is what the nation state of the Jewish people, which is the recent, the most recent attempt at constitutionalizing the meaning of Israel's Jewishness, brought to the to the fore this disagreement of what it means for Israel to be the nation state of the Jewish people. So what Zionism means. Mm. But there are also many arguments kind of before um, uh, before kind of the Basel Declaration, which uh, outlined um, different possibilities for other places to be considered as yes. the Israeli state. So we had um, kind of, there was a proposition of, of Uganda, of West Africa, and there was also the proposition of Argentina. So the, the Balfour Declaration um, is what then kind of gave um, Jewish people in Europe. Uh, no, the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement, sorry. Um, the, the kind of motivation to then move back, back to what they had seen as their ancestral homeland over 2000 years ago. So what part did Britain maybe play um, Gilbert in, in this movement? Uh, yeah, well, uh, about the Balfour Declaration, uh, one of the most interesting uh, uh, issues is that uh, the only member of the British government who was opposed to it was the only Jewish member of the cabinet at that time, yeah, Montaigne. And uh, he described it as anti Semitic. That's exactly the term he used. He said this declaration is anti Semitic because it's treating the Jews as not belonging here, but they should belong to some country where there are already other populations, Christians and Muslims and the rest, and I, I don't see why uh, this, this should, uh, should happen. And uh, actually, he was more than, than right on that, because a key motivation of, the, of Christian Zionism is basically anti judaic because this is a, a, a view which uh, believes that the, the Jews, I mean, the the coming of, of this state of Israel would be uh, the first step towards the, uh, the reckoning, and then the Jews would need either go to hell or convert. I mean, this is a very anti Judaistic uh, 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 perception. Um, so, uh, I mean, th this was a calculation by, by the British government of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, having uh, a group. There that uh, would be, as they believe, um, I mean, would maintain close relations, would be dependent on the colonial uh, power, uh, close to the Suez Canal in a, in, a, in a part of the world which is uh, quite strategic, which was already quite strategic with the First World War. Um, and that's it. I mean, that's what, uh, what uh, Britain was about. And as someone uh, said uh, famously, uh, they, they uh, I mean, they, they they promised a land which which they didn't own, to, you know, to, uh, and so uh, so that's that's the, the the issue. Now Britain got entangled in contradictions there, and by the end of the British mandate, Britain wanted to since 1939, since the beginning of the Second World War, Britain had tried to uh, to revert its course and published in 1939 uh, uh, a white book which called for one single state 
with a proportional representation in the government of that state of the Jews. I mean, depending on their number in the, in the country. Uh, um, and, uh, but then, you know, after the Second World War, that they, they just handed over to the UN very cowardly and left the region, having created this huge, huge problem, which has been the source of so many, uh, so many tragedies. Now, there have been uh, on some uh, of the Jewish critics of Zionism in, in Palestine, or on the Arab side much more, even the, the Arab states, there have been several proposals of a, a unitary state with proportional representation. And those were, of course, completely rejected by the Zionist movement. Uh, um, and, uh, and the, the reason is there, that is, Zionism is the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. Now, you may find people who, for instance, don't want to uh, put into question Israel as a state, but would want to put into question its Zionist uh, character, and that they would call for a state of all its citizens. So that would be co directly contradicting the view of the Jewish state uh, such people, Ilan, indeed, I think you referred to Ilan's book, uh, the idea of. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, he speaks a lot about those. They, they, they are not called anti Zionist, but post Zionist, hmm. because they are not exactly anti Zionist. Uh, they don't, as I said, put into question this state within its borders, uh, the 67 borders, not uh, okay. But uh, they are not Zionist in the sense that they don't adhere to this, this project. And again, if you take now the, uh, some of the, the views that uh, the government of this country wants to impose on universities and the rest, uh, even saying that should be regarded as anti-Semitic, which is, of course, uh, farcical. I mean, this is just, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the government of this country celebrated the centenary of the Balfour Declaration as if it was a feat, you know, glory. Uh, they, I mean, this is uh, just uh, tells you about how how the colonial mindset is very much still, uh, you know, dominant in, uh, in the power elite of this country. So I think this is a good place to move on to Sinus's political history, having just discussed this. So. Um, in April 2021, the NGO Human Rights Watch uh, released a report which discussed Israeli policies towards Palestine, and they prefaced the report with the comment that laws, policies, and statements by leading Israeli officials make it plain that the objective of maintaining Jewish-Israeli control over demographics, political power, and land has long guided government policy. Um, in pursuit of this goal, um, authorities have dispossessed, confined, and forcibly separated and subjugated Palestinians by virtue of their identity to varying degrees of, um, of intensity. Sorry. So, um, Elan, in what way has Zionism influenced Israeli action in Palestine? What, what has it really been doing? Yes, there's, uh, there are two ways of answering it. One is the, the more general uh, influence. And then you can, uh, well, we don't have time, you can unpack it. And, and so in different periods, according to different circumstances, how uh, Zionism operated in vis-a-vis uh, -vis particular challenges. But in general, as uh, Gilbert mentioned, Zionism was a settler colonial movement and Israel became a settler colonial state. And most settler colonial movements have two dimension to their uh, methods of uh, fulfilling their aspiration or having of having a nation state on someone else's territory. Uh, one dimension is geographical or space, and the other dimension is demography or population. The more space you take uh, of the new homeland, the more uh, alien population in the eyes of the settler colonial movement you have. So uh, in many ways, uh, the Zionist movement was successful in terms of geography. It more or less by June 1967 took over the space that its own ideologues regarded was essential to maintain uh, uh, Israel not just as a Jewish state, but as a successful defensible uh, Jewish state, or as they like to call it, a viable 
a, a Jewish state. Uh, the problem was, of course, that once the uh, geographical, the space, the space was achieved, um, the one was, there was consensus over it, uh, the demographic problem for the settler colonial state became even worse than it was before 1967 in terms of millions of people who were not Jewish and could not be regarded as, as Jewish or uh, as first uh, first rate citizens inside Israel and definitely not as citizens at all in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, this uh, preoccupation with demography is I think the, the most important, it, by, by no means the exclusive, but I think is the most important face of Zionism. Uh, you, you know, uh, recently, uh, just yesterday, the Israelis turned out Ukrainian refugees who were not refugees and sent them back to the Ukraine and allowed only the Jewish Ukrainians to get into Israel. This is the demographic uh, demon of Israel. Uh, it's a racist consideration of your citizenship according to religion and race. And uh, I think this is the most important factor in forming the relationship that Zionism has with the indigenous, indigenous native people of Palestine. Because it, there is no way that uh, you could uh, uh, be part of the project if you are not Jewish. Definitely, there is no way you can be part of the project if you are an Arab, because there are quite a lot of non-Jews who arrived from the ex-Soviet Union who are part of the project. But you cannot be if you are Arab. Uh, and that's why the Arab Jews had to de-Arabize themselves. Otherwise, they would not have been accepted in, in the project. And this is something that I, I think uh, uh, leads also to the dehumanization of the natives, of the indigenous. Again, nothing exceptional here. This was true about settler colonial movements elsewhere. As the late Patrick Wolf said, when an indigenous population stands in the way of creating a new homeland, for Europeans who were expelled from Europe, when they are faced with an indigenous population, uh, the logic of the elimination of the native is being activated. Now, elimination doesn't always mean genocide. You can eliminate the native by various means. You can enclave them, you can ethnically cleanse them, you can rule them with different metrics of, 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 uh, of laws and so on. This basic DNA of the Israeli society, not in its relations to its own Jewish population. That's another story, a very intriguing one. But it's very face in front of the indigenous people who regard themselves as a different nation, who believe that they are part of a liberation movement, who are dreaming of that liberation and have quite a lot of support for that liberation. This, the Zionist ideology has no solution for that problem. You cannot find in the present literature, ideology, interpretations, call it what you want, of Zionism, any realistic, any moral, a non-racist solution to the problem that Zionist, Zionism created in Palestine. The only way out of it is to de-Zionize uh, Israel. Then you might find a solution. It's not the end of the world uh, uh, What after Everything that happened in the last 120 years, there are still, I'm very optimistic about it, there are still very good options and scenarios for living together. But these scenarios cannot be carved out of Zionist ideology today on all its interpretations, on all of its interpretations. Uh, maybe there was a time in history that it could. I'm talking about the present reality. The present interpretation of Zionism does not offer us anything in terms of reconciling uh, uh, between the uh, what is now the third generation of Jewish settlers and the indigenous people, uh, uh, native people of Palestine and Palestinians. So you talked a little bit about um, de-Zionizing uh, the state of Israel. What, how would you go about doing that? What would you be your main? I mean, how, how do we go about mm -hmm. de-Zionizing states that has been kind of based on an ideology? Yeah, I think we should uh, connect to a uh, very important global conversation that takes on, that, that is happening as, as, as we sit down there, uh, which is about decolonization. We used to regard decolonization as an historical chapter that ended colonial power. 
more and more of us are using decolonization, and I think rightly so, rightly so, in decolonizing institution, knowledge, practices, attitudes that are rooted in the West and in the North, if you want, of the globe, and are still determining the way we treat uh, people who are not part of that community. Uh, and, and I think that this is also true about Israel, that you need to dismantle institution that reflect a, as the racist nature of the Zionist ideology, that you have to have a set of laws of uh, in, uh, educational and cultural infrastructure that create a, 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 a state of all its citizens on the basis of equality as much as is possible in modern times, together in my mind also with social equality, not just political equality and social justice. So, so the end game is very clear. Obviously, obviously for an academic to sit in my chair, which is a very com comfortable Norwegian chair, uh, uh, it's easy to talk about the end game, but not very easy to, to talk of how you get there. What I, and, and I cannot solve every, every uh, uh, hurdle on the way to that end game. But <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm part of a movement of Israelis and Palestinians who believe that incrementally and from below, you build a different reality, a desegregated reality, one that does not obey the Zionist ideology, one that obeys universal uh, values of humanity, of social justice, of economic justice, one that is ed, uh, uh, allow people to not only to learn new attitudes, but to unlearn the old ones. So you have to unlearn Zionism as much as you have to learn how to live without it. And history shows us that privileged societies did not dismantle themselves voluntarily. That is true. So I'm a great believer on a very strong pressure on the state of Israel, but I hope that a nonviolent pressure would be enough to prevent what would happen anyway if they don't uh, change their ways, which might be that they would be forced to change. And that is not good for anyone. You, they, you, you know, the Israelis have this dream that an earthquake would append them to, to Italy, even better to Norway, but it won't happen. Israel is in the Arab world, is part of the Arab world, has to connect to the Arab world, has to be part of the problems of the Arab world and its solutions. Now I can understand, I'm, I come from a German Jewish family. I can understand if our European Jews would find this scenario intimidating, concerning. I know about white Africans, uh, uh, South Africans who left South Africa. This is a price we should be able to pay in order to, to create uh, 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 Palestine and Israel again, as, or to reformulate them as an organic part of the Arab world, so that also the Arab world would benefit from that solution. It's not just about the Palestinians and the Israelis anymore. It's about anyone who lives in the Mashrat, but also even in North Africa. So we this is something of a, a, a systematic change, you know, that has to occur about human rights and civil rights decolonization and the end of oppression that is not limited to Israel and Palestine. But if you exclude Israel from that discussion, you are perpetuating the oppression, not just in Palestine, but also in other parts of the Arab world. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, one. Any possible solutions uh, for solving <laughs> <laughs> the current problem? Oh, she's well. Well, I mean, for me, the, the key word for any solution mm. uh, is self-determination, right? Uh, and self-determination is, first of all, the self-determination of the oppressed. But the self-determination of the oppressed should not create a new uh, injustice or a new oppression. Mm. And therefore, you sh there should be a way to find uh, a compromise between the self-determination of the oppressor in that case and the self-determination of the oppressor once the oppressor is no longer the oppressor. And that's the, the issue that I think also uh, Ilan was uh, 
uh, hinting at you know, his own background and all that. And you know, one should say something. The, the, the white South Africans had far more reasons to be afraid than the Israeli, the Jewish Israelis, because they were a minority, you know, of uh, com being, uh, compared to the, the, the black population. Uh, whereas it's, these are the, the reverse uh, proportions within the state of Israel, 67. And uh, this is one of the most effective military forces on earth. So, uh, I mean, this anxiety is, is I think, uh, cultivated by the Zionist uh, ideology, by the Zionist movement. I mean, Zionism, uh, as Herzl himself said, uh, the hatred of the Jews is not our, our propelling force. And so you have to create all the time this view that the whole world, not only the Arabs or the Muslims, or the whole world is somewhere, you know, I mean, you just scratch a little bit on the surface and you'll find anti-Semitism there. This kind of very pessimistic view of the world it, it is, you know, the, the daily bread of, of Zionism. And, and, and that's, that's uh, a complete, uh, you know, uh, is a very reaction, I mean, very uh, right-wing view of the world, like, uh, you know, this kind of very right-wing pessimism. And, uh, and I think, I mean, it's good that you have people like, you know, more optimistic. <laughs> Although I would say, <laughs> frankly, I, I have hope, but uh, uh, I wouldn't speak myself of optimism because it's so tragic and I'm not seeing the, 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 any light at the end of the tunnel. So we, we keep hope. Uh, I make a distinction, I'm sure Ilan would agree with me. Hope is something, optimism is the belief that the best will happen, but hope is the belief that the best may happen. So it's a matter of hope. And he nods, he said, he's okay, <laughs> as I was sure he would. <laughs> I, I want to say something. Uh, I would tend to to offer from us, I have no idea. Uh, but I'm happy to offer some uh, some analysis or some diagnosis of of, of issues that both uh, Ilan and uh, Linda have mentioned or touched upon. Um, as long as the state of Israel identifies its uh, as on the track, its very reason of being as being the state of the Jews, not the Jews. And as long as this necessarily means a demographic anxiety that which Iran has. In light of the Holocaust, which we can never put aside, there is an, there is an identification among Israelis, among Zionists, among many in the Jewish world between Israel and the Jewish people, between the survival of Israel and the survival of the Jewish people. Now, Jibel has already mentioned it. the very notion of Israel ceasing to be the state of the Jews, transforming to a, a different polity, a state of politics, is that the binational state, but is by definition the end of the state of the Jews, and by the common political cultural understanding, the end of the state of the Jews is the end of the Jewish people maybe only potentially first and then practically or maybe immediately practically but in the this i think mahmoud mamdani has noted this before we jump into trying to give the israelis the south african example and maybe encourage them to think of potential scenarios one of the main tasks is to allow israelis to allow people outside of israel in the jewish world also people outside of you know israel, to allow them imagining political horizons in which this binary is not the only option, but there are alternatives to it. And if we dare to go there, I would say more than that. Ilan is thinking about self-policy citizens of some other states. Uh, Gilbert, you mentioned uh, self-determination. I would say, can self-determination be without the state? So not the two-state solution, not the one-state solution, but the no-state solution. Because if we think about extremism, so much of the extremism we discuss is the nation state. Zionism is not unique here. I know that we're discussing Zionism here, but this is the topic. This is the matter of discussion. But it is just an iteration of our political structure that 
emanates from Europe that exports itself to the world, that tears apart large parts of the world. I mean, the position of the South uh, Asian subcontinent, of, of the Indian subcontinent, is maybe the, the closest and most uh, non relevant in context. Uh, so, if we wish for something, I would say let's try to wish for political solutions that actually offer alternatives. Thank you so much. So I think we're running out of time now. So we're going to open up the floor to questions if anyone has a question. May I comment yes, just course. very briefly because mm -hmm. I yes, like mentioned the Mandanian. I just finished uh, recently writing a criticism of his book on, <laughs> on this issue. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you can jump over this right to self-determination of a people, which which goes through a national moment, right? But you may have a coexistence of self determinations, even in the form of state of proto states like a confederation. Like that. When, when we speak of binational state, that may, may very well be a, you know, a, a form of, you know, the key point is self determination is just that it's not uh, something that is imposed by force on the people, but it is something that they opted for democratically. And that's the key point. It, it doesn't necessarily need to be a state or in a state form. The key point is self determine their future. And that's the, the that's the point. And it's important maybe to know really shortly on this that really one of the recent developments within the Israeli public sphere is the flourishing of a discussion among Zionists on a confederational or federational uh, horizon. About to sound in the which follows you or not? That's the thing. People are people are talking about. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um I'd like to open up the floor to questions now. If anyone has any questions, please just raise your hand and uh, yeah, you can ask anything. Yes. Would you, would you like to take this question? Yes, uh, I didn't hear all of it too well because of, of the technical. Uh, so I, I do apologize if it's not exactly the answer and I just heard what I wanted to hear. Uh, <laughs> I came to a comfortable answer to, to the questions I liked. Um, so I apologize before him. Um, there are two things. If I, if I did understand uh, correctly. So first of all, historically speaking, uh, this binary between settlers and indigenous is very valid academically, you know, scholarly like. So, so it's not necessarily uh, a value judgment to begin with. It's, it's uh, the difference between people who come from East Europe and for whatever reasons want to build a new life in someone else's homeland and the people who lived there for centuries. And, and that particular binary, that particular difference between the two groups of people uh, in settler colonialism is one of the first things that the settler colonial movements ignores. In fact, fabricates. The Zionists saw themselves as the indigenous people coming back and they saw the Palestinians as the aliens. 
and therefore this this uh, uh, kind of recreating a certain vocabulary that does justice to history and to truth in many ways uh, uh, is is very important. I, I think for for understanding. Uh, why there are certain moments of violence, why there are certain hurdles of reconciliation and so on. So I find, I find this binary, if you want, or this, uh, this framing uh, uh, is, has, that has nothing to do with anti-Semitism or any disre uh, disrespect for, for, for Judaism or anything. This has to do with the historical reality by which Jews settled with the help of the British Empire mainly and colonized Palestine and were rewarded by the international community accepting their project as legitimate, as did the, um, the people in the United States and in Australia. There's nothing exceptional here. But the second, and I think this is far more important, I never had a problem with people's narrative and the validity of their narrative. If people want in Greece to tell themselves that they are the descendants of the ancient Greeks. I don't think they are, but if they do think so, I'm fine with that. And if Italian thinks that they are the descendants of the ancient Romans, beautiful. And if the Jews who live in Odessa believe that they are descendants of the Jews who were expelled, if it all Jews were expelled by the Roman Empire, let them do this until tomorrow morning. The, the validity of that story is of, intellectual interest, but no more. But the moment that a certain narrative, and that's typical of settler colonial movements like Zionism, the moment a certain narrative, regardless of its validity, is used to justify ethnic cleansing, operation, eh, eh, oppression, I'm sorry, massacres, inhumanity, racism, then the narrative is problematic. Then the narrative becomes an issue that we are dealing with, again, not because we don't respect people's, the, the kind of thing that people tell themselves, but we are very worried about things that people tell themselves they are self-harming, every psychologist will tell you this, and especially if they're harming someone else. So we need to help them change the narrative if the narrative is so powerful in determining what they are doing. And I think what the uh, settler colonialism as a paradigm does with all the uh, valid criticism on some of it. And with this, I will end. The paradigm of settler colonialism enable us to see very clearly where the narrative is a story people tell themselves and where the narrative becomes a justification for inhumanity and racism. And that's, we couldn't have done it very well without that paradigm before. And that's why I think this is very important to continue and, and expand our research in that direction, because there are many things we still have to do that. Fantastic. We have the time probably for one more quick question. Um, at the back, you had your hand up first. Um, yeah, do you think there is a relationship between the conflation of like anti Semitism and anti Zionism? Oh, sorry, anti Zionism and anti Semitism? In what has led to sort of, I don't know about this country, especially in the US, an extreme drive in sort of um, demonizing any narrative um, that might be like pro Palestinian to sort of being anti Semitic? And do you think that actually caused or contributed to the sort of right wing shift that has taken place over time? And how do you think, like, in, in terms of when we talk about extremism, and if we do want to talk about how to reduce that, do you think that actually making that distinction more accessible to people would help with sort of overcoming that problem? And how would you do it? Essentially, because oftentimes, like, it's, it's very difficult to have a conversation. If you just use the wrong term, or if you just use like one incorrect word, especially with the intellectual circles. And so it's like, and you know, automatically, like something you say, you know, what you want to say is not exactly what you need to say. And so, how do you sort of um, deal with those things? Would you like to answer this question? First of all, I think uh, that okay. already has uh, you know, discussed this yeah. in, a, in a, I would say, convincing manner. Uh, I think it's important for uh, us, people taking part in this discussion, to insist on the distinction between critique of Zionism and, 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 and Jew hatred. Um, it's true that people 
where anti-Semites use the Z word to sometimes hide. It is also true, again, without falling into the trap of making you know, equivalence, but it's also, it's also true that the main drive to identify every Jew as a Zionist is a Zionist drive. So I would say the best way to untangle it is specifically to offer a Jewish perspective, critical or otherwise, on Zionism. Um, you know what? I'm tempted. I'm sorry. Because I just was reading something else and this came up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is from the rabbi of Tsikover in Poland, 1900. <laughs> For our many sins, strangers have risen to pasture the holy flock. Men who say that the people of Israel should be clothed in secular nationalism, a nation like all other nations. The Judaism rests on three things, national feeling, the land, and the language. That national feeling is the most praiseworthy element in the brew and the most effective in preserving Judaism, while the observance of the Torah and the commandments is a private matter depending on the inclination of each individual. May the Lord rebuke this evil man and may he <laughs> who chooses Jerusalem seal their mouths. I'm, I'm bringing this just not only because it's a very strong uh, formulation. This is a Jewish traditional critique of Zionism. Now, if we fall into the trap of saying anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, this whole plethora of uh, different Jewish perspectives on Israel um, I think it is simply or not. Again, having said that, without playing the role of uh, advocacy, you failed in bringing, if you wanted to have an advocacy of different point, point of views, all three speakers, I think, are <laughs> attentive to reality more than to ideology. Um, so without falling into a, a of advocacy, I would say it's important to note not only the atmosphere of this, you know, current times where certain words are inflammatory and, and, and so forth, but also to be attentive to how our discourse is understood. So sometimes it takes a lot of uh, preliminaries before one can say something, but still uh, falling into the trap of just you know silencing and uh, or, or accepting you know dogmas uh, is nothing any one of us would want to. Amazing. So, okay, I think we're going to have to end here in terms of time. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>